It is my absolute great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Christian Heilman, known to everybody as Code Poet. Big round of applause. I have a little bio here. So Chris Heilman has dedicated a lot of his time to making the web better, as we know. Originally, he came from a radio journalism background, and he built his first website from scratch around 97, and discovered JavaScript at that time and cursed it. Spent the following uh, years working on lots of large international websites. He spent a few years in Yahoo building products, ex Yahoo, <laughs> um, and explaining and training people, and is now at Mozilla. Uh, he wrote and contributed to four books on web development, and he's written he's written hundreds of articles and hundreds of blog posts for Ajaxian, Jaxian, Smashing Magazine, Yahoo, Mozilla, Script Junkie, and many, many more. Uh, he's you know what, and he's basically going to give a talk on HTML5 and how it's changing the world and how it makes the world a better place. Christian, all yours, man. Thank you. All right, it's, back to be, uh, it's fun to be back in India. And I think the last day uh, or last four days, everybody asked me why I never come back to India or why it's so of not so often that you see me over here. And the main reason that I talked to people about was that it's quite rather hard to get a visa here because I have to have my passport in England for a whole week normally, and I'm never in England for a whole week. So it's rather tricky to get the visa. But that's actually uh, partly a lie because um, it's a more emotional thing. I lived in Mumbai in 2003, and I met this incredible woman back then, and uh, we broke up, and sadly enough, we never saw each other again. And uh, she was she was amazing. She had weird eating habits, but I, I guess you get used to that. But um, I still remember her. But she never emailed. She never called. It was really, it was as if I didn't exist any longer. It's just really really annoying. But yeah, this is what I looked like: young and long hair still. It's good. But back back to what we have here. Um, wasn't yesterday absolutely amazing? I mean, I was like, I, I did not know what to expect for JSFU. Uh, the organizers are great guys, and I was like, I was expecting us to be in some hotel lobby with 400 people in it, and the project that it didn't quite work, and everybody would be like, saying like, oh, Google said this, so we have to do this now, Microsoft said this, and everybody here had something great to tell. Everybody had some great demos, and uh, it was new materials as well. It was nothing that I heard before, and I'm at conferences every week. So there's cool new stuff uh, that people talk about here, which I don't see much at other conferences because I see people repeating their talks or giving talking about the same things. Or instead of giving people information, they just show tools for one and a half hours and tell them, like, if you use this, then you're a professional. Otherwise, you're going to be out of a job tomorrow. And here it was just like, okay, this stuff is interesting. Look at that. Look at that. And uh, uh, I was originally planning to do a lot of HTML demos, like really cool stuff. And then I saw yesterday, and I'm, I don't have to do that anymore. You know, we saw like 3D sound. We saw like uh, Gaddafi starting sending uh, drones out with uh, with Node.js. And it was all in all a, a, a very exciting experience. And uh, it was good to see that this stuff works. And I find it interesting that when, you, when you've been following HTML5 uh, and JS conferences for a while, like I have, you, uh, you end up with the same stuff all the time. Like, oh, this works if you turn on this, uh, uh, this extra thing in the browser, and this is a nightly browser that only I have on my computer, and you cannot do something with it. And it's getting better. That's what I like about it. We don't have to have these special built browsers any longer. Stuff is already in the shipped browsers nowadays, in most of them, of course. So my life is actually explaining HTML5. And I get the same things from everybody. I get these same prejudices all the time that like, oh yeah, it's never going to work and native is going to be better and like, oh yeah, Facebook said it's not going to work. What do we do now? So I talk to developers, I talk to designers, I talk to journalists, I talk to VC people. Everybody has a different idea of what HTML5 is about. And in my case, it's quite interesting because it's these massive extremes. I either get the people saying, like, HTML5 can't do that and will never be able to do that. You know, people that are afraid of that there's different browsers out there. Like, ooh, if only there were one browser that the government gave us and we have to use that one, that would be great. Like, that would mean the government can spy on us. Oh, wait. Anyways. 
people keep telling me that they, that's not possible, that's not possible, that's not possible because it's not across all browsers. And I think we have to stop doing that. We have to stop thinking. Uh, as a web developer and somebody who loves the web to bits, I always said you have to support everybody. There's no way you can block people out of the internet. Just around here, looking what people are using, what kind of horrible devices, and you're like, Okay, or the DNS handshake here being more like a DNS walk in the park, finding the other house and then doing a handshake. We have to think about everybody out there and we cannot say that this is the browser that you have to use, this is the environment that you have to use. But that does not mean we have to support everybody the same way. Like when I talk to a journalist and he says like, well, this doesn't work in Internet Explorer, so it's not ready yet. That's not true. We have if statements. We can ask the browser, can you do this? And if it can do that, then we apply it. If it doesn't, if it cannot do that and it might not miss it, we give it an interface that still works. There's nothing wrong with a search box and a button that actually sends something to a server and comes back with a list of results. Of course it's cooler if it's got a spinning thing and rotating in 3D and unicorns dancing in the background, but you don't necessarily need it. Like I found it here in the hotel when, when the connection was really bad. I cannot use Facebook, I cannot use Google Plus because without a JavaScript fully loading and being fast, the interface is not even responsive yet. Whereas Twitter falls back to a normal, a normal input field and I can still send things off. Or it has an API that I can write this thing if myself in a few lines of code and send my things off that way. So support means not the same across all devices. That's the worst thing to do. That's like sending a JPEG on the web and then calling it a website. And even that wouldn't be the same because the color differences between browsers and between displays are different. So you cannot say it's the same everywhere. The other one, of course, is that people that get very excited and say that HTML5 can do absolutely everything. These are the people that send you like 23 Mac websites with 570 resources being loaded that scroll, when you scroll do all kind of cool things. We reinvent Flash a lot. We do the same things we did in Flash back then. We were like, these computers is fa computer is fast. We can do something about this. Let's animate a lot of stuff. Let's do background music that nobody needs. Let's do some opacity on, on top of other things. Let's make sure we have got everything. I love that, that they're like, they're selling tattoos, lemonade, and dog biscuits. That is entrepreneurship. This is the kind of stuff that you go and actually go to VCs with. We're going to do that, dogbiscuits.com. And... When I see people getting excited about loading animations, or like you see these like showcases of 600 CSS animations to show a loading animation. You've done a mistake when there's a long loading animation. If somebody has to wait for a minute for your website, you steal their life. You're killing them with a little knife continuously. Like I don't want to wait for stuff. I want to have it. And I, if it doesn't look perfect up front, but I can use it, that's the most important bit. Not the like, oh, please, 15 minutes, please wait 15 minutes. We have something cool for you. Yes, you got excited about this. Your designers are excited about it. I just wanted to buy a ticket. And I don't, restaurants are my favorite. When you go to restaurant websites, you're like, what do I want? I want to know the menu maybe, but I mostly want the telephone number and where the heck the restaurant is. That's all I want to know. Will the telephone number have a tell domain so I can click it on my mobile phone? Most likely not. Will the address be somewhere? Yeah, about this big in the footer and above I've got like a panorama of how great the thing looks or what the, what the food is supposed to look like and then you go there and you eat it and you're like, it's not what you have on the website. Might be England. I mean, we don't have food. So I, I think this, there's, there's lots and lots of in between these two about getting overly excited about HTML5 and also saying like it doesn't work because it's a technology. It will never work 100%. Everybody who tells you that Flash was easy because everybody had Flash installed never worked with Flash because Flash had so many different versions and different differences between Mac and Windows and no, Linux not at all. So uh, it was the same problem there. And this is a country where all these things are pretty flexible. I mean, I saw this the other day uh, on a poster here that you have these, these, these scooters being sold and it says maximum occupancy is like two people, normally like man and wife. But then you see them in the streets and there's like the kid and the other kid and then like another kid in there and a cow and a monkey and uh, uh, basically uh, whatever can fit on these things. It's absolutely amazing when you go on the road and you're like, no. <laughs> and I love it when, when, especially when you have the kid there with like a helmet on that the kid fits into the helmet. <laughs> you know? <laughs> or people don't put the strap on their helmet on. Yeah, that's going to help you in a full frontal thing. <laughs> that's great. I saw guys with hard hats. That's another really cool thing. Like, it's like, oh, look, I'm safe. 
yeah, from bricks falling on your head, but not from cars crashing into you. But at least we've done something about it. But th this flexibility I want you to apply to everything. Now, HTML5, what we call HTML5, has a lot of disappointments. A lot of times I, uh, I want to do something and I cannot do it. And there's many reasons for that, or sometimes I just want to use it because I want to use it, not because it makes sense. Uh, or sometimes something is like prefixed in one browser and we're like, why does not every browser do that? Because prefixes are there to try things out. Prefixes are there to be, not there to be trusted. If something says WebKit dash at the front of it, don't use it just as the only thing. Let it fall back to something without the WebKit or something useful like a background image. Background gradients was the big thing. Chrome, uh, uh, Opera had to move to the new rendering engine because half the mobile web was broken on Opera because people said WebKit, linear gradient, background, this and that. And then you had like white buttons with white text because it wasn't a WebKit browser. Like if they had said background green and then background linear gradient, it would be a green button. It wouldn't hurt anybody. It would still be a beautiful button. It wouldn't have a gradient. Oh my God, that maybe makes it faster as well. So make sure that you don't think about just prefixes all the time. But it's even getting better when you look at the standards. HTML5 has been defined quite some time ago now. And uh, it's still not finished, but that was another stupid question. Like, when is HTML5 finished? And Oh, in 2022. And you're like, you just pulled that out of somewhere. And said, like, oh, yeah, give him a date, and then the journalist shuts up. Not understanding that journalists put these things out in headlines. But the standards sometimes have interesting bits in them where you're like, how, what did that come to be? Now, video. This is how I embed video in a page. Everybody's like, oh yeah, HTML5 video isn't ready yet because there's like uh, these browsers that are special and different from others, like i6. And uh, we got to do something about that. So normally people say like, okay, here's HTML5 and then we fall back to Flash or we fall back to Silverlight. Not so much. We fall back to Flash. And I think it's not needed. It's really not that necessary anymore. Because uh, uh, you just encode the thing and have Flash in there and all kind of things. It shouldn't be up to you as the developer to do these kind of things. So right now, you have a video with controls that gives you the controls, a poster, which is a preview of the, of the video in case it doesn't load fast enough. And then you have the sources. You've got your MP4, which should still be the first, because the first iPhones had a problem if that wasn't the first. Then you have your WebM for all the other browsers, and we have Og Video if you really want to go to old browsers and still support them, browsers that already support the video tag. And then I just fall back to an image and say, like, here's an image of a bunny. Yay, bunny. And it links to the MP4. Click to watch the video. Like, why should that not be? Why should I have to simulate another player in there if the user could click on it and watch it in VLC or M player or whatever they use on their computer to watch videos with? Of course, providers will be like, oh, then they can download my video. You can download the video anyways. Stop being so defensive about that. So, but the problem is, if you don't do that, what happens then? Like, MP4 is not supported in all browsers because it's a proprietary file format. It's not an open file format. So in Firefox, we cannot put an MP4 decoder into the browser because it's not free software. We would be pirates if we did that. Yeah, it would be cool, but it would be also illegal, so we can't do this unless MP4 becomes completely open. That's why we do WebM. Huh, okay. So the logical person in me says like, okay, this is a video element. If the thing cannot be played, it should fall back to this, right? Because something went wrong. If I have an image in the page that cannot be loaded, the alternative text is being displayed, which is the same fallback mechanism. Not so much. This is what you get in Firefox. And this is not a good experience somehow. Like, especially that, like, no video of support and format that mime type found. The amount of people would look at that, like, what's a mime type? Is that like a clown? Or is it like, like one of those guys that goes like, <laughs> like, I have no idea what you're talking about here. So, the fallback is only for browsers that don't support the video element at all which is a, a dwindling mass of like small browsers and things that should have died years ago. And uh, I find that hard to believe that we have to know, how do I do a fallback then? How do I make sure that I know the browser played the thing? Of course, as a JavaScript developer, there's probably an event handler. Take a look at it. Okay, document query select the video, get the first video in the page, 
add event listener error, tell me where it hurts, tell me what's wrong, please tell me what the error is. That should work, right? Every time error, on error on Windows tells me whatever something happens. No, silence, nothing coming in, and you're like, okay, what do I do? And what do you do when something like that fails? You tried everything in your, in your arsenal, Maybe reading the specifications is a good idea. That's always the last option, right? <laughs> like, oh, let's make it work in all browsers and then see how W3C thought about doing it. And this is how you have to do it. So you select the video. You select the source elements that are in the video. You get the last source element and you apply an event listener to that one. And when an event, an error event is, is fired on the last source element, then the video cannot be played. This is defined in the specifications. And you're like, what? Like, if all fails, why don't, you do, why don't you fire an error handler on the video itself? What other error handler could ever be on the video element? Rather than like, I'm not supported, but then it wouldn't fire an error handler either. So these things we have to jump through from time to time in, uh, uh, in the standard implementation are interesting. And you know what? I think it's because we don't give feedback enough. Because we let these things happen and say, like, oh, these are clever people from Apple, from Microsoft, from Google and Mozilla. I'm not clever enough, so I'm not going to do this. But this is not useful. This is really, I had to hack this. And the people are like, oh, my God, you found out how to do that. This is not how a standard should work. We should find out how to do it. We should have it in the spec somehow. How about the operating system? It's the other thing that lets HTML5 down. Um, because we have not support for everything. The best browser when it comes to HTML5test.com right now? Anybody guess? No? Uh, yes, to a degree, but Maxton because it switches from rendering engine to rendering engine. One, one engine browser. Blackberry. Blackberry browser. How excited are you about Blackberry? But what they do with HTML5 is awesome. Really good work. So I'm trying to hire a few of those guys. Um, I'm working with them. <laughs> so, operating systems. What is the biggest problem about operating systems? Stock browsers. This is exactly what we had with Internet Explorer 6. And we all loved that one to bits. The problem with Internet Explorer 6 is not that it was a bad browser. It was an awesome browser when it came out. The problem was that it was hardwired to the operating system. So, if you wanted to have an upgrade for the browser, you have to upgrade the operating system. If the operating system can come out for six years, it's too expensive to update or doesn't give you anything useful that you want to update with, we're stuck with an old browser till the end of time. And the amount of people, the amount of effort we put into IE6 and things like that is really not worth our time at times. Times at times, so whatever. But this problem prevails. Because if I look at right now, at things like validation, for example. Validation is awesome. Like the amount of JavaScript validation libraries out there is stunning. They're also all pretty useless. Because if you're only validating JavaScript, I have a command line. I have curl. I can so hack your server. Like, don't trust JavaScript as the only way of validating. So why do we spend so much time in writing validation things in JavaScript? Because browsers don't do it for us. Unless you have an HTML5 browser and you put just a required attribute on the thing and when you send this off now without entering anything in it, you just get, please fill out this field. This is beautiful. It's stylable. You can change that text. That text is actually localized to the operating system. If I had a German setting on that one, it would be the, uh, the other message there. And users could get used to that. You know, like, when, when I do something wrong, this is what it looks like. Not like, when I do something wrong, there's a rotating elephant and, like, blinking signs or, depending on other people, a small button on the bottom. Like, error handling should not be a surprise for people. It should be something that we're like, ah, it's that again. Then we have a problem to actually make secure systems out there and not just style them beautifully. And this works. This is wonderful. I just put a required on there. I don't need to actually write a JavaScript validation. I need to write my server validation because that's the most important bit. This is where people attack, not in the JavaScript bit. And um, the browser would not send off that form. I also get the, uh, the, the red outline here telling us that something went wrong. I can style this outline as well. So I've got a, a pseudo selector in CSS for that. Great, except 
IE 8 or 9 not supporting it, well, that's no surprise. But iOS, Android, Opera Mini, and BlackBerry until 7, nothing. And how cool would it be not to have to do client-side validation on a mobile device? This is where I really want that, not on the desktop. Nobody supports it. And you have the problem with like uh, with like 2.1, 2.3, 3.0 and stuff. I heard yesterday a lot of people asking me, what do I do with about 2.3? And I'm like, you just cut your hair and stuff like everybody else. Because that Chrome, the browser that Google loves to bits and I love to bits as well, is not available to older Androids. And you have to buy a new Android. Just pisses me off. Sorry about that. But it does, because I should not have to buy a new phone to get a better browser. This is 1980s thinking. This, we should be better than that. And both Firefox and uh, Opera are available until, back until Froyo on Android. Problem is, like, we can, we can optimize any way we want to. 90% of the end users out there, 99.73% of the users out there, will use the browser that it comes with. This thing is called Internet and has a blue, uh, a blue world button. That's probably the Internet. I'm not going to install any other browser because that's too much work. So we're stuck with these terrible things because we keep making the same mistake of hardwiring the browser to the operating system. And unless we break that, we will never have a chance as web developers to get the coolest, newest for all our end users out there. Unless everybody jumps to your new operating system and gets rid of, rid of the old one. I don't see that with Windows 8. I don't see that with iOS 7 right now. I just hope that people get tired of this as well, of being told what they have to do. Autocomplete, another one. Input list browsers, data list ID browsers with all the lists in there. This, is, this has been done to be backwards compatible. So on a browser that doesn't support any of the data list stuff, doesn't matter, it's still an input element. And you, but you have to send them to your server or you have to check in JavaScript and say like, well, it's not one of those, so it can't be the actually what you wanted. But if I start typing here right now and I just go in and say like an O for example, it gives me Internet Explorer, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, everything that has an O in it. Or I say I start with F, it gives me only Firefox and Safari. So you can pre-fill input fields. This is cool. This is what we wanted as well. So we don't need to use that jQuery autocomplete widget or YUI autocomplete widget because it comes already in the browser. It's done for us. Again, none of the stock browsers, IE Mobile doesn't have it, Safari never cared about it, IE doesn't have it either. These things should be green, I'm sorry. This has been standard definition. This has been in the HTML5 standard from the very beginning. Instead, we come up with new things all the time that actually are prefixed and say, like, our browser does this now and the others don't. So the so basic support for things are missing. So we're all doomed. That's it. There's no way actually we can be web developers because all the browsers are terrible and HTML5 has a lot of problems as well. So sad beep. Sorry, that was it. Actually not. We're just a bit short-sighted. Um, if it's not supported, it will be supported. If it's, uh, if it's supported in others and gives us a lot of benefits there, it should not stop us from doing it. Nothing will ever be supported across all browsers. Because there's different things about why you would do an operating system. <laughs> I mean, the web is a great thing for us, but for somebody who wants to make money by selling native applications, making the web be really, really good on the device is probably shooting yourself in the foot a bit. Which, I mean, it's a business model that can't scale either. I see, I, uh, I see marketplaces going away in the next five years because they're going to collapse on themselves, much like download.com, twocows.com, e-commerce, big platforms, msn.com or Microsoft as the number one thing to go on the web collapsed on itself. Yahoo is not your starting point for everything anymore. They have realized that there's other services out there that you're using as well. People want choice. People don't want to have one thing that gives them everything. But what do I mean about how we're short-sighted about this? We try to fix everything with JavaScript because we're intelligent and we know how to fix things with JavaScript. Instead of going to the mailing lists on the, uh, and filing bugs for browsers, we write yet another library to make it all work fine and just use my library that does two things different from the other library that you used last week. We spend so much time learning about abstraction layers rather than just trying to get the platform fixed. And that's why things like simple implementations of like autocomplete and stuff fall through the cracks 
because because uh, browser makers don't realize that people use them. I talk to engineers in Firefox, and when I say, for example, why don't we have slider? Well, we looked around, nobody uses it. This is our fault. This is our web developer fault. If we don't use this new stuff, browsers don't have any browser makers, the builders on the browser, the engineers that are busy with lots and lots of bug fixing, don't see it as a high priority to do it. It's like, it's a chicken and egg problem. If we don't use the stuff, that's not going to get implemented. And it's a very simple thing to say like, oh, web developers don't do that stuff, so we have different priorities to do other things. So please use things instead. Now here's a, uh, here's a great example from uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. I gave a workshop and uh, one, of the, one of the people in there, Abhinav, uh, is he here? Yeah. Tweeted me and said, like, I had this problem. And as he's a great guy, he tweets with a JS fiddle. So I can see the problem and I can test it myself and not like, I have this problem, fix it for me. What is your setup? Fix it for me. What is your, uh, how does it not work? Oh, it's not working. Firefox is shit. Like, it's, that, that's the kind of feedback that I get a lot. But if you want me to fix things, send me the thing that where it hurts. Now, this was the problem. He wanted to have a newly generated element to fade in smoothly. Like, evil people just use jQuery and say fade in with that. Because it means the browser has to do it in JavaScript, and it's getting very slow, and the battery is dead, and you just basically, you kick kittens. Instead, he used CSS, like... CSS is there to do these things nowadays for us. Doesn't do anything in IE6, doesn't throw an error in IE6. Fine, use it. Problem is, uh, he created a new element, appended it to the body, set its opacity to zero, and set its opacity to one, and that should do it, right? The CSS has a transition on it, so that means everything that is changed in this element will transition smoothly in within two seconds to the other state. Problem is, this jumped from zero to one everywhere. Like, basically, pfft, except for Chrome. Chrome did it nicely, I think. No, it didn't. But anyways, it was just from zero to one. It was just black and there, and there was no, no fading, and what, what do we do? So then we look into how browsers work. Then we look into how things are being rendered in browsers, and we find solutions. So one of the solutions is uh, get computed style element opacity, reading out the computed style, which forces a layout. So that one actually tells the browser, like, do something. Hey, did you do it? And then, like, do the other one. That works in Chrome and Firefox. Uh, get the element client height. So reading anything from the CSS means the browser says, like, okay, this is it. And then it applies the next one, forcing the browser to do something in between with the thing to make it work. Or a set timeout with zero, which is the biggest hack ever, which is like an eval if you think about it. Because it's just like, wait zero seconds and then do this. So um, that works. Uh, some of them in, in others, some of them not. So what they did in the live page was using jQuery uh, hide show immediately next to each other. This is not what, this feels wrong. Okay, what do we do about this? <laughs> I put it on Twitter um, and, and uh, one of the results was like, okay, set timeout is bad and it is. We need to use request animation frame. So here is the JavaScript solution to make this thing work. This now works in all the browsers right now because it actually reads out all the different support for request animation frame. It generates a new next animation frame where it waits for the next rendering of the browser and does these kind of things. And I was like, okay, this thing should work according to the specs it shouldn't work but what what was the problem here the problem is that we do a css animation a transition but we change the content in javascript so we set a style element in javascript which is a completely different rendering than from what css is doing css is doing it a, a first and then javascript later so we change things in javascript and then we wonder why css doesn't know about it because css is already i'm done i don't want to have anything to do with that document anymore that's why you have to do the uh the set timeout of zero so i said okay what, what, what do i do with it i don't do anything in javascript with the style collection stop doing that it's a last resort if you want to do something beautiful to some element, put a freaking class on it and let CSS deal with it. So I said, okay, create element div, append it to the body, set a class name on fade on it. And then I looked, what can I do in CSS to make that work? 
and it was not a transition, it's actually an animation. So div opacity zero, div fade, uh, animation fade 5s, and then you basically do a keyframes of fade from opacity zero to opacity one. This is how it works across all the browsers. And it's hardware accelerated because it's only in CSS and it happens before you render the rest of the page. So stay on target, don't cross the streams. Because we can do everything in JavaScript does not mean we should do everything in JavaScript. CSS is there to do the transition, so CSS should probably also be the one that changes the opacity and not JavaScript changing the opacity and wondering why CSS is uh -uh, not mine. So make it in one technology and let the technologies talk to each other. Worry a lot when someone says use a 10 millisecond delay then everything works. That's like this painting over cracks in your, in your, in your ceiling and wondering why the wind goes still through. So when something says like, oh, just a timeout, we'll do it. Like this is how we fixed Internet Explorer 6 and this is why we still have it. We fix too many problems that people think we shouldn't have to get rid of it. Stay flexible. Transition not working? Maybe an animation is the right thing to do. Play with the different technologies. Learn what things do. Understand that a transition is a different thing from an animation. A transition transitions from unknown to unknown. An animation, you define what you want to animate. So in this case, if we only want the opacity. Fine, great. So we do it in an animation. Piling a fix on top of a hack on top of a polyfill really kills kittens. That's what the long code was about. Like, oh, request animation frame is not supported in Internet Explorer 6, so we have to do something about request animation frame. CSS animations and transitions are not supported there, so why do you even bother with that? But we just add and add and add and say, like, this is better now than having it just working. Think about use cases of things that you might not have uh, thought about before. We saw yesterday the, the motion sensing in, uh, you know, from the camera into canvas and like detecting the pixels of the hands. I've seen that six years ago in Flash, much slower, funnily enough, but we have these kind of things. Now, one thing I always wanted to have on the web and I never had was irregular rollovers. So this is an image with like uh, transparency and non-transparency. So if I go on the image, it's linked and it actually has a hover effect. If I'm not on the, uh, on the pixels of the image, I'm not. Cool, isn't it? Huh? That's a PNG? And uh, in the past, what you do, you, 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 get, you, you go into Photoshop and you paint uh, an image map around every single element and then when your image changed, you had to paint that again and you're like, oh, not fun. Image, image maps were not fun at all. So how do you do this? First, we start with events. Get a, get a rollover image and start using a mouse over, copy image on mouse over, hover on mouse move, and reset image on mouse out. This is how you do event handlers. Stop that whole jQuery on click, blah, 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 blah thing. This works everywhere. This doesn't work in Internet Explorer, and it means like, oh, it's not for you. Good. Do an, just do as your first test if a window at event listener. And if not, don't give JavaScript to that thing. It's very simple to do. Copy image takes the image, which is the target of the event, sets the, uh, sets the, uh, 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 I, I created a canvas element up front. Sorry, that's missing here. So I created a canvas element and do it, did the, store it in C. And I set the width of the canvas to the offset width of the image, the height of the canvas to the offset width, height of the image. And then I put the image inside the canvas with the height and width. I don't even have that canvas in the page. It's just at in memory, which is the fastest way to deal with a canvas because it doesn't have to paint it. It's not intercepting with the browser. And then I just say uh, the image offset left and the image offset top is in OX and OY. This means so I detect if the mouse is actually in the image rather than like trying to detect the mouse where, it, where the image isn't. On hover, I get the client X and client Y minus the OX and Y to find out where my mouse position is. And then I get the pixel color, in proper English spelling, of course, uh, from the image data of the image. And that is just reading one pixel. That's not looping through the whole array. That's not necessary. You can actually, in image data, you can say just one pixel by one pixel starting at X and Y. If the third intro, intro in, the, uh, in the pixel color array is zero, it means it's transparent. Then add a class of over to the, uh, to the image element Otherwise, remove a class of over from the image element. 
at the image array has like RGB and opacity on each of on each of the pixels. So all I needed to do was read out the third one, which is the fourth one in human terms, and I have the thing in there. On reset image, I just get it out there and I remove the class over again. And that is all I need to do to actually have this effect. And uh, as I put it together in a little in a little JavaScript, irregular shape rollovers, that works with uh, with images that have the opacity. So these are PNGs, and this is a GIF, for example. And this one is actually even linked. So when you click here, nothing happens. When you click on the pixels, then it actually goes to the page that is linked. Was that possible? Never thought of Canvas that way. Canvas to me is a, is a toy to play with pixels. Other people use Canvas to paint things, and it's good for that as well. But having pixel, uh, pixel uh, uh, access to an image is awesome. So what can you do with this? Another little demo that I've done uh, uh, in a workshop, actually, is this pixel uh, zoom and pick thing. So what that one allows me to do is take an image, for example, uh, image bucket here, and drag it into the browser. So this is drag and drop API with file reader API, works across browsers, and now I've got the image in my browser here. And when I now move my mouse around, I can see the colors up here, and I can see the RGB values and all the things there, and I can start collecting colors. And once I'm happy with the colors, oh, actually, they're off screen. No, no, you can see it a bit here. Uh, once I'm happy with my colors, I can just say get code, and it generates the CSS for me from the colors that I collected. No server involved, no framework involved. The whole thing is a few lines of JavaScript because I use that trick of reading out the pixel array and just create things. Also uses local storage, so when I, re when I reload the thing, I always have my collection of most beautiful colors that I have from different images. Sometimes really good if you get a logo from a client and you have to get the images out there. You don't have to start Photoshop. We can do this in the browser nowadays. It's time to step up. It's time to think more about like what can you do as a developer to make HTML5 better. And this is not only to help me, this is to help all of us. If, I think it's time to stop complaining like, oh, why isn't HTML5 working and start using it. And start using it in a secure manner. Do an if statement around it, nobody's going to get hurt. That's all fine. We need to improve. This is me being unhappy with mobile development. Um, we need using HTML features. Especially start reading on them. Don't just go for the, like, this is the coolest HTML5 interactive music video on a ball with, like, 3D sound and these kind of things. Start looking at what HTML5Doctor.com has written. Start looking at like HTML5 rocks, the old empowered things. Go to the HTML5 landing page on MDN and find out how, how this stuff works. It's not hard to do, but it's actually much more exciting than showing it, than looking at a demo that looks really slow on your computer and you can't do anything with and you go back to your job and you're frustrated. Like finding something like a, uh, like a data list or finding something like a required attribute, you can use that in your job right now. And it makes much more sense than actually dreaming of being able to work for Google and then be allowed to do these cool things that Chrome has just in the latest beta. Be open to people who want to do good. And we always talk about Microsoft, uh, we always talk about Mozilla and Google when it comes to HTML5, but Microsoft does amazingly good work. They gave us the, the, the Frankenstein hybrid of a touch interface with a keyboard and a mouse. And we're like, okay, how the hell are we going to do that as a JavaScript developer to find out is like, was this a touch? Was this a keyboard? Was this a... And then they gave us the pointer proposal that it says like, okay, something happened. You do an event listener on it, and then it tells you if it was a touch, if it was a keyboard, if it was a mouse click. So they solve their own problems and actually make them standards. When it comes to the W3C work in HTML5, I think Microsoft are the ones that give the most in. Because they have to, because all their clients are like these very evil, no, not evil, very traditional government companies, very, very uh, enterprise level uh, uh, agencies that wouldn't do anything that's a standard. They want a standard. And this is what the W3C is about. So it makes some more sense to listen to them, what they're doing as well. Adobe, the people who gave us Flash, and obviously kill kittens if they gave us Flash, they actually do a lot of great HTML5 work now. There's great performance talks by the HTML5 team. And uh, a lot of Flash developers have a lot of knowledge that we need right now. We're, we're reinventing a lot what Flash has been doing years and years ago in HTML5 right now, and we're having the same mistakes, we're having the same problems, but nobody talks about these Flash guys. We're just like, I use Flash, Pfft, nobody needs you anymore. 
instead of like, hey, how did you solve that in Flash? And do you want to take a look at me? Most of the time, they'll be like, oh my god, that API looks awful compared to Flash. But we're like, yeah, that's what we have, so deal with it. But let's l help us get this thing better and find out the problems, like all the off-screen canvas tricks and stuff. We've done that in Flash before as well. All the rendering issues, all the syncing of audio and video that has been done in Flash as well. We just have to talk to people. Brackets of Adobe is an online editor, uh, an HTML editor written in HTML. And it's an open source project by Adobe. <gasps> it's a great open source project by Adobe because they actually do things like triaging bugs. If there's new bugs that come in that actually are very simple to fix, instead of fixing them, they, they, they tag them as beginner bug. So if you want to be part of Brackets, you go to the repository, you look at beginner bug, and you fix one of those and learn about the project while you're fixing that one simple bug, rather than just looking at the project and being overwhelmed and not becoming a contributor. So they're doing a really good job in getting new people in. BlackBerry, I said, has the, the BlackBerry browser, and they know everything about every other browser as well. That was really interesting to talk to the BlackBerry guys at the Sencha conference. And Samsung is bringing out Tizen, and... Great, another eight, another open HTML5 platform. Shame the workshop isn't, well, the workshop's happening afterwards. And I'm speaking at a Samsung conference because I just on Twitter like, hey, you got a conference, do you talk about HTML5? And they're like, yeah, you want to come? Okay. And then like, I thought they put me in a side room and stuff, but they're like, yeah, our, our CEO doesn't want to do the HTML5 talk, so you do that now. And I'm like, I don't work for you, but that's okay. That's why I like working for Mozilla, I can do that. At Yahoo, I couldn't have talked at, the, at a Google conference or something. That would be nice. Demand more basic support for HTML5 standards. Yes, this is hurting because Firefox does not have input type range. But everybody filing a bug about this or commenting on the bug, then maybe I can go to our engineers and say, like, let's fix it now. We need more complaints about basic missing features of HTML5 in every browser, especially in the iOS and in the Android browsers as well. Offline first. The first question I get from every journalist is like, yeah, HTML5 will not work because you always have to be online. Bollocks. You have app cache, you have IndexedDB, you have all kind of cool offline storage stuff going. You can make your application work offline fine in HTML5. It didn't work in the first iOS. That's why everybody tried it out once and said, like, it's not on a cool shiny thing. Oh, that's broken. No, they catch up as well. They listen to us from time to time. Not often, but they do. So... There's no fixed resolution. Nobody switches their browser for you. This only works in Chrome. Everybody will have Chrome in a year's time. No. This is 1,024 pixels wide. Awesome. I can do that. <laughs> iPad 2, iPad mini. Both 1,024 resolution. iPad mini has 2 inches less on the screen. Can you detect if it's an iPad 2 or an iPad mini? No, you can't. So all your 1,024 resolution... Uh, layouts that you've done for iPad completely break on the iPad mini and you ask Apple if you can do something about it. Uh, no. So don't fix for any size. And if you do a responsive design, which you should, don't do like 800 pixels. Do 820 pixels. Give a bit of leeway. People have fat fingers. People resize their browsers differently than you think they do. So what's coming in the future? What's the future of the Internet? And it's probably kittens in 3D because kittens already are great on the Internet and people love these kind of things. One thing that I think is very important is that we start having semantic HTML and hardware access. Hardware access is something that we define with the web APIs in Chrome packaged apps. There's a lot of stuff happening. This is a battery meter in that, that line of code. A meter element, which again is not supported in iOS, um, Document query select the meter, navigate a battery, add event list and level change show. Value is the battery of the, the level. Now it's fully charged. Earlier it was like a gray thing here and a green thing there. I can build interfaces. We needed this in Mozilla to start with Firefox OS. You cannot build an operating system without having this kind of information and the kind of access to the hardware. And instead of just saying, okay, this is Firefox OS now, we made it a, a specification for the W3C, and it's part of the, uh, of the W3C specification now. And now every other browser can implement that as well. A few already are working on it. A few already did it. And this is the cool stuff that we're going to have in the future. Sensors. That's an interesting one. Uh, we saw that yesterday that you access the camera, and the problem is with all the WebRTC stuff, as long as the camera is running, it's basically get becoming very, very heavy. 
it's like my computer is burning up and use a lot of battery and it like uh, my camera is on all the time and I'm not closed. It's not fun. So this is the battery, uh, the device light sensor that actually gets the light around the computer. So you can see now here, if I put my hand on this, it goes down to zero. If I put my hand away, it goes down to up to 25 and stuff. If I shine a light into it, um, how do I do this? Hang on. Damn Android. If I shine a light into it, it goes up to like the 5,000s, 7,000s and stuff. This is cool. As a developer, I want random numbers coming from stuff. I can do great visualizations and all kind of things with that. And you know what? The camera is not on. The camera is not recording me. This is already happening because I have the backlit keyboard on MacBooks. This is exactly using the same sensor as that. This is exactly using the same sensor while your Kindle or your Google Maps switches from black to white from to white on black. This stuff is happening already and I got access to that. I've, I haven't done it yet, but you can make a gesture animation, a gesture detection with that, just by seeing the difference in color. The, the difference in, in, uh, in light. If I go closer to the, uh, to the sensor, it gets darker. And if I say it's like, if the difference is like 100, 150, I know probably what the distance is going to be. So it's not going to be like a Kinect. It's not going to be a, like, like a leap motion. It's not going to be like WebRTC, but you actually have already a sensor in there that you can play with. And that's pretty sweet. It also means that like uh, your fan will not go off. I always said like we already have a web API that accesses the fan. You just start with the with web uh, with WebGL and the fan will start as well. But web components, that's the big one. That's the big one that we to me need. Right now, the browser is busy painting things. 60 times a second, 60 fps. Uh yeah, frames per second, which is not 60 times, but it's frames per second. And that's cool. Looks smooth. We like it. It's wonderful. Then we start putting widgets in there in JavaScript. And we use set timeout where you say every 200 milliseconds do this. And the browser is basically painting and we go in like, it's like sounding your horn here in the street, like which happens all the time as well. And the browser then like, I eh, don't want to do that. Give me more battery. Give me more, more memory. Give me kind of things. We work against the browser. And with web components and shadow DOM, and all these other standards that are out there, we will have a chance to actually become part of these 60 frames per second. Instead of having a widget that works against that and hopes that it signs, that it hides, uh, that it syncs up with it, we become part of the rendering flow. And that already is in the browsers and we just don't know it. If you look at Chrome and you look at the debugging tools and that's coming in Firefox as well, this is a video of Firefox OS here. And the video is basically, in Flash, this was a black box. I had no idea what that thing is. I basically just had a video. In, no, in newer browsers now, I can rotate that. I can change the opacity. It's like any other HTML element. But what is this here? What are these play buttons and the control buttons here and stuff? Is that Flash? Is that Java? Is that whatever? No, it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The only thing is you don't, have, you don't see it in the browser unless you turn it on in your inspector. So in the inspector here, I actually, when I do, uh, when I go to the video here, I have turned on the, uh, the shadow DOM. So this one has a document fragment in here, which is not that easy to read. This one has a document fragment in here. Bad finger syndrome again. And then it has a div. And the div has a display none here. And another div has this WebKit transition on it. And there's an input type button. And you see I'm debugging down here. Nothing in the browser, like input elements, like video elements, like uh, uh, upload buttons, these kind of things, are magical code. They're HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They're just part of the browser. That's why becoming part of the Chrome team, becoming part of the Firefox team, doesn't mean you have to be a C++ developer. You can be a web developer, because lots of it is written in JavaScript by now. And the Shadow DOM allows me to access that and see that. So with, with, um, with web components and Shadow DOM, I can build new tags that render with the browser rather than like having a document and then putting things inside it. And that one means that it's part of the normal rendering flow of the browser and it, it's becoming much, much faster. So uh, there's lots of stuff happening there. There's a lot of Google projects. One thing we have in Mozilla is called Mozilla Brick. And we actually built this because we need it for Firefox OS again. 
Uh, I have it open here, but I don't have it open here, so I click this one now. On GitHub, like everything else, there's no, there's nothing hidden, so we, we show how bad our code is, so you can help us fix it. And this is what it looks like. To have a flip box that, that does this, all you have to do is put in the page X flip box with either a flipped or no flipped element and two divs with the front face and the back face. You then have access to it with the, with the event listeners and in the event listeners you just do a flip box toggle and, you, and you're there. This is how easy it will become to build your own widgets. And the other thing of course with that one is this can be styled independent of the rest of the document. CSS had that issue that it was like atomic, it was like boom. Like, hey, here's the font color. If you want to put your widget inside my page, overwrite everything. Otherwise, it will actually look in Comic Sans Serif rather than the one that you wanted to define. And as these things are inside a document fragment, they're actually not inheriting the style from the main page. They can have their own style. They also don't inherit the, uh, uh, the events and these kind of things. So you don't have these race conditions you have with click handlers nowadays. And there's all kind of stuff in Brick already. This is, you can, you can use that now and you can download it now. You can build your interfaces with it. For example, a date picker, which is kind of kind of interesting because there's a date picker in HTML5, which we don't support. Actually, hardly anybody supports. But this one now is a date picker here that allows you to put a calendar in there. And all is the markup is X date picker. And you set properties, the value, the submit value, and polyfill in case you want to. Polyfill means if the browser already has a date picker in HTML5, it doesn't do anything. Otherwise, it generates that date picker for you. And uh, you have like you can submit uh, questions and all ca and all kind of stuff in there. It's a new way of thinking about building web components, uh, building websites and web apps with markup that is reusable. And that's what everybody wants. Everybody on iOS that is an iOS or Android developer comes up to me and says, like, "Where's your SDK? Uh, we don't have any. It's the web. Use whatever you want." Oh, that's too complex. Don't you have building blocks that we can pick and mix? Yes, we do. Now, with the brick stuff, we have an opportunity of doing that. We don't want to force a look and feel onto you, but I think it's a, it's a new way of thinking about it. And Google is totally on board with that, does a lot of stuff with it. Uh, I, think, I don't know, Microsoft has done anything with it, but Shadow DOM and Web Components to me is what we really, really need because I'm tired of having to fight the browser and as a JavaScript developer know how browsers render and how they fail. Like the whole thing about having an interface that tells me when there's a reflow in the browser and debugging it, this is clever, but I should not have to know this. This is stopping me from being an effective programmer. I know how Internet Explorer 5 fails at rendering different drop-down boxes. Do I need this knowledge any longer? No. But I had to learn it back then, and that back then I had to get a job that way. Now, let's go really wild. Uh, who knows about Mozilla Web WebMaker? WebMaker is a way to actually get people onto making the web. We teach people HTML, we teach people how to build their first website, we teach people that you can do a command U and you see the source code of a page, which is not the matrix, it's just HTML, don't be scared of it. And we allow people to start playing with the web. And then we realized, of course, there's apps out there, so how about we do something for that as well. And this is what Flathat or the app maker is right now. So this is a very, very beta. This changes every time I reload it, so I'm not quite sure because I don't control that server. It's a colleague of mine in Canada. This is what it looks like. So you say, let's start with this one. And it gives me an interface, and it starts loading the components, and it actually loads long, and it's actually slow, which is not good, but fair enough. And instead of just giving you an interface, it actually becomes a gaming thing. Like, hey, how about you start building your first app? How about you, are you clever enough to do that? Add a button to your app is the, uh, is the first mission. Okay, I've got a button here. I drag the button in there. I've got a button in my app. Level one, done. Cat random. Put that one in the page and actually put that one on your page. So you say like, okay, where's cat random? And these are all web components. These are not DOM elements. These are all already rendering in the shadow DOM for you. So random cat is here. Put that one in there and completed level two. The uh, random cat gives you a different, ca a different cat every single time you actually press a button. Uh, how about a rating? Give a one star rating. So I find the rating thing here, put that on there, and then it loads it slowly but steadily. I click on the one star rating. Okay, you got this now. 
And now start your mission, shoot a firework. So what you do is you have a firework controller here, which I still don't know why they did that. But that is basically beautiful for people to see. I've got a firework controller here, and that does nothing. But it has a shoot rocket. Like, how do I do the shoot rocket now? I need a button for that. So I actually put a button in there, and when I start pressing the button, I shoot a rocket. And now, hey, now you can start building your application. And this is how easy it is to do these things. I can put, for example, a metronome now in here, which is nothing else but like a, 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 a game thing. So that one now shoots rockets every second. And I can change the setting of that metronome. And, or they changed the interface for that. So, oh, there you go. I can customize that to 0.2. And then instead of every second, I shoot lots and lots of rockets. And of course, this is pretty pointless. So let's do something else. Drop this on the bin unless it doesn't work anymore. Okay, let's start a new app. It works. It's a, it's a, it's an alpha right now. But you have things like, for example, a shutter, which allows me to actually take a picture. And then I have a, uh, an image preview, which I put on top of that, an image vignette, for example, as well. And I connect those two. And if I now click that button, I got access to the camera. I can take a picture of myself. I can use this picture. And it comes up in the vignette thing, unless it's broken. But it's working right now. OK, fair enough. But you don't need to look up on WebRTC. You don't need to learn this kind of things. You can build this application. And if the application is now, you can, for example, have a list as well. Let's do something simpler. A list and an input. And if I now say uh, Moo, and I submit this one, it accesses it to the list. But I didn't give enough space. Hey, betas, awesome. But once you're happy with your app, all you have to do is basically say publish. It published the apps on the internet, and I clicked that too early. And I got a URL. And in this URL, now this is my application that actually runs. Doesn't have much in it right now, but it's installable. So I can take this now, for example, and put it on a Firefox device, Firefox OS device, Firefox OS simulator. Start that one. I've got Firefox OS running on my computer now. Yay. Ha. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> Probably I shouldn't start it like six times in a row or something. Put it in there, put it on the web, put the URL in there that I just had, click the install button once it loaded, install it on my operating system, go back to my go back to my computer, and the app that I just built in the browser is available on Firefox OS once it's loaded and does something. And that's how easy it should be to publish apps. And this is what I want. This is what we need. We can be so excited about our libraries. We can be so excited of going to the command line and, and start a, a drone and things like that. But end users out there are also developers out there. And there are many developers out there that don't want to write by hand. So having an app like that, having a tool like that, to me is the future. Because we have to get this thing easier. iOS and Android is not hard to build an app. HTML5 is too hard to write an app right now. So think about building tools. Think about building components. The whole idea of uh, a web components is that these things become reusable. I can actually take the button that is in the browser right now and inherit everything from it and then create my super button instead of having to start from scratch again. Everything becomes OO in the browser that it is not right now. Of course, it will take time, like installing Windows 8 from floppy disk. But we have a movement. Something's happening. Things are starting to roll. Things are starting to get together. And I hope that today I managed to get you a bit excited about thinking about what we have, looking back into the documentation and finding out about things that you might have forgotten about and thought are just not possible. Because the just not possible from half a year ago is now very, very possible because browsers come out every, say, every six weeks. This is what you should be thinking about. And that's all I had for now. So thank you very much. We'll have plenty of questions. Anyone? Uh, Hi. Okay, back there. Hi. Yeah. Uh, do you think there is a, a lot of sync needed between three T39 and the ESX community with the uh, W3C? And say, for example, like uh, um, web components. For example, like when web components come out, they don't 
even though the browser comes six weeks once new version, it doesn't really realize a web component. So there's some project like Polymer coming up or WebBrick, or there are so many poly polyfills and shims floating around. So do you think what's stopping the uh, the, the browser uh, vendors to implement and uh, and do you think there there must be something between the T39 and the ES6 community uh, with the the HTML5 groups because uh, they they do something and it's out of sync and they then catch up and this phrase is happening from a yes. couple of years. Uh, that's always the big problem that that we define things in standard bodies and browsers move faster than that. Then developers build shims and polyfills to make that thing work for everybody as well. And then people say, why don't browsers have that yet? And why isn't it standardized? Standards are more than making something work. It's really hard to make a standard really bulletproof. A lot of standards were rushed in the past. That's why we had security problems in uh, in web sockets. That's why we had like that's why things like web intents came out in Chrome and vanished again in Chrome. And everybody relying on it is like no chance to do anything right now. So um, the implementation phase of what browsers are doing is very very important. The shimming and polyfilling phase is something that I think we're getting too excited about. We're thinking we're super clever to make it work in all the browsers right now, and then we even don't look at making the standard work anymore. Standards take time, and especially committees are a big issue because a lot of people have different things to put in. But it's up to us as developers as well to go to these committees and say, like, we need this stuff now. Make it, op uh, make it optimized. Let's stop getting too excited about one browser does it this way, another browser does it this way. We want to do this right now. And I think polyfills, the definition of a polyfill, when Remy Sharp defined that term, and it's basically something to just cover cracks in the wall in England. That is polyfill. This is not stuff you should rely on. This is just things to fix things quickly, and a polyfill on shim should vanish over time, but we rely in on them. I mean, jQuery is, uh, is something that made it easier to access the DOM, and now everybody relies on, on it. Phone gap was defined to be redundant. Brian LaRue is very open about this, saying like phone gap should not exist. It was we just wanted to cover the access to the hardware with web APIs and things that we define right now. Until that's possible, we need phone gap. So the standards bodies are a mess. I, I gave up on being part of that because I don't have much, enough time because I don't sit in an office. I'm traveling the whole time. But there will be harmony. We had harmony in JavaScript as well. It will, it will happen. It just needs to be the fanboying about like, oh, Chrome has it already. Why is it not in every other browser? Is holding us back. And the same with Firefox, the same with everybody else. And the specification has to be bulletproof before it's something else. The same with like people saying like, why isn't CSS like SAS? Because SAS doesn't have a specification. SAS has an implementation, a documentation how to use it, but how it actually does what it does, it's never defined. And that's something that is very, very tricky. And especially when you, when you, when you stop, when you don't mix the implementation and the standards body thing, then you have design by committee in the standards bodies. Then sooner or later somebody says, this is the way it is, even if nobody uses it. And that's why we get, that's how we get things like XHTML and WML that nobody needed. So as they keep saying, a, a camel is a, is a horse defined by committee. Like put this in, put that in, put that in. So there will be harmony, but I think the, the most important thing is that we actually, as developers, as professional developers, we should push for standardization and not say like it works in one browser. Cool. Why doesn't the other browser do it? You guys are falling behind. You cannot rely on a browser. They will go. Google might go bankrupt. Not that likely, but it might. And it might go away and then all the implementations are not there any longer. It needs to work across browsers and the standards define how it works across browsers. Hope that answered some things. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, HTML and CSS and stuff, they basically started off as a document format and now it's becoming this application engine with brick and web components and all that. Except the thing about the internet, unlike, for example, iOS, there is actually some value in letting go some of the decisions that were made years ago so that you get much cleaner code and all that. Apple's kind of good at that and it actually drives innovation, but we are stuck what, with like, like changing this. the scrolling without telling people? Uh, don't, <laughs> don't even start me on that. Don't, let's not go there. No, but there is some value. I mean, we have to use a ugly margin hack to center stuff in with CSS and all that. And that se it seems like that is never going to go away. We have Flexbox and all and coming and all that. I just want you to comment on that because that's how the web is different, right? Like the decisions that were taken 20, 30 years ago we are living with right now. There's still super decisions though. There's still incredibly decisions and there's nothing wrong about uh, about something saying that everybody should be part of it. Uh, the 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 myth that innovation comes by breaking other things 
can happen, but it doesn't have to be the right way. I mean, look at the BlackBerry interface. This is incredibly innovative, but I couldn't use the thing for the first half hour until I read the documentation how to use it. So um, we, the document model of the web is a terrible thing for application development. That's why we have to come up with something like uh, uh, like web components. And before that, we used Flex, we used uh, we used uh, Java applets, we used all kind of evil things to make to break out of that uh, that document model. But for example, uh, when people get very excited about JavaScript uh, uh, JavaScript applications, one page applications, links are not evil. They're a totally cool thing. Like a link that I can send to a friend in an email is the best way to actually promote your application rather than like having just like, oh, you go to the marketplace, you type that into the search box, you find my application and you start installing it. So the what made the web what it is are totally fine. Some of the decisions about documents and how to access the documents, they have to go away and they get better. I mean, that's why we have query selector instead of just document get element by ID and get elements by tag name. That's why we have uh, things like CSS animations and transitions now, because that was just not part of JavaScript, and we still did it in JavaScript. So we moved it into the uh, into the layer that actually does the the look and feel rather than the, the behavior. Um, I think you cannot the, the backwards compatibility feels like a crux to a lot of people that come from application development and other platforms, but it's also what made the web the web. It made it as easy as possible to actually publish things. Everybody can become a maker. And uh, uh, I mean, when I showed at my workshop two days ago, the, uh, a lot of people still don't know that uh, you have um, CSS3 stuff. There you go. Uh, you have now things like um, Flexbox, which fixes a lot of these issues. My favorite about CSS and layouting, when you said like margin hacks and stuff, is that you go to Stack Overflow, you have a CSS problem, and a Java guy answers you. No, not happening. Please don't do that. And don't tell people layout tables work, because they don't. But Flexbox, for example, allows you to do proper layouting in the page. This is still prefixed in different browsers differently, but we're getting there. So this one, for example, has this one, two, three. These are just div elements without any, with a margin and padding and border. So making these 100% is already a problem, because you have to, if you give them all 33% or 33.3%, you have to, to uh, get the margins off or you get the borders off and you have to start calculating. You can calculate in, in CSS now with calc, that's possible, but in Internet Explorer it was always the pain that, that is just not fun. And nowadays I can actually say like if I don't want to have them at the end, uh, at the start, but I want to have them at the end, I can move them to the end. If I want to have them to the center, I can actually move them to the center. I can actually move them vertically as well. So I can say start or end, or if I don't give it anything, then all of them get stretched to the height of the element. Similar height columns, look at that, we finally have it. Like that was the biggest problem always. Then you can say, for example, um, you have the problem that all of them are now uh, not filling up the space, but if you take that one out right now, oh wait, if you take that one out right now, they all fill up the space immediately and I don't have to do any of the calculations of the borders and the paddings and the margins. That's the kind of stuff we have already. We just have to use it and give feedback how it breaks. Now this is not disco enough, like if the second one needs to be bigger than the others, how about I just give it that and it calculates the rest of the space around it for me. I don't have to do that in JavaScript or in CSS myself. How about order? This is one, two, three in the, in the source order, but if I need the two at the end of it, do I have to go back to my HTML and change the order in the HTML? No, this is not 1997 any longer. I can actually move that to three here, and it moves it to the end of it. I can move it to zero, and it moves it to the front of it. So we got all these things in the making, and they're just, this is more or less right now a specification thing. So this is where this is happening. But we need this. We so need this. And uh, uh, we don't get it if people say like, okay, because we don't have that in the in the document thing, the web is broken as it is, and we have to replace it. I don't think that the document structure of the web is going away anytime soon. And I think applications and package applications are super important, but in the end, somewhere, somewhere somehow, will people will go and want to see a website to find your application. So we cannot break that backwards compatibility of the web. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, guys? Um, oh, sure. Okay. 
Hi. Hi. Today, if you see the websites are converting into the web apps, and uh, as you said about the uh, HTML document model, now if you see the uh, web apps, the browser back button is always a problem for the developers. So no matter how, uh, there are various things to achieve the back button problem. But do you, don't you feel that there shouldn't be API to disable that back button because that is a problematic to a developer who is developing a single page app, not a website. That problem has been there since Flash. We we have uh, we have the history API. We have ways to actually stop a back button from working. Uh, in terms of UX, if you think about that, about the interface to get rid of them, uh, applications can be full screen. There's uh, 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 a lot of people think HTML5 applications are applications that run inside a browser. No, HTML5 applications can be packaged up to have the full screen, and that's actually what an application should have. We should have access to that. It was interesting seeing yesterday that Microsoft showed the full screen API because that one has been in, uh, in, in many browsers already for quite a while. So for example, this slide deck here, which is written in HTML5 as well, has a go full screen button. And out of a sudden, I don't have anything else any longer. You even have things like the, for 3D gaming, you have a pointer lock a, uh, 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 API that when you have a 3D game, having your mouse cursor would be absolutely awful because you turn it 3D and then you get to the end of the screen and you can't turn it anymore. Much like when people start using the mouse for the first time and they end up at the end of the mouse mat and they're like, what do I do now? And with the, uh, with the pointer API, you just rotate the 3D space with your mouse rather than like having a pointer in there every, uh, anymore. So these things are there. I think when you talk about HTML5 applications, we have to start thinking about that these are not in the browser. These can be packaged. These can be full screen in a browser. They can be used with PhoneGap and things like that to use them on iOS, to use them on Android as well. The browser is there to get you to an application, but the application can take over the browser later on if you wanted to as well. It's a security thing. So that's why we have this like, oh, do you really want to go full screen? which I think is important because otherwise I can make something look like your interface of your bank or like Windows and ask you for your passwords and stuff. But the uh, uh, neutering the browser and taking things off the browser uh, uh, functionality is to me not sensible when we have ways to actually get break out of the browser nowadays in a secure manner. In the past, we'd only had a way of like saying like, uh, uh, do you really want to go if you press the, the back button? And then, of course, you have the uh, iOS 7 just had this wonderful problem uh, that just came out, um, that you, it, it generates the, the, the URL bar when you, go to a, when you go to a page, and then you scroll back, and then it vanishes, but it doesn't, it doesn't fire a resize event. So there's a, massive, uh, there's a good article about this right now out there, that uh, full-screen HTML5 application in iOS 7 are completely broken because you don't, have, you don't know when the, when the bar is going to show and when it isn't. And that's, that's the, one of the things that we need to actually fix. And, we had that problem in uh, in Android uh, Firefox as well, and we actually documented it, so Apple is welcome to come and go with that. But I think uh, your application, you should think about having the full screen. You should not have to think about, like, what if people uh, uh, reload the page? If people reload the page and your application is well done, it actually gets the thing from the app cache and index DB as well, and nothing should change. If your application breaks when somebody just goes to the page before, then I think something is wrong already. We have a chance to give the application into the face of people, but inside the browser, they should still be in control and be able to do things. I, for example, like to highlight things in a document and translate it. That should not be possible. That is not possible when you don't allow me to highlight things within your application because you think people only do bad things with that. So functionality should not be limited to what the browser does, but think about HTML5 applications as being outside of the browser. The browser is just an engine for your applications. But sooner or later, every platform will have HTML applications that can be installed and run like any other application on the operating system. Hello. Yeah. Um, my question is about uh, getting a HTML5 and a JavaScript application indexed, basically. So if you look at Google, for example, like it doesn't uh, index your uh, JavaScript content. So it, if you just submit the URL to Google, Google Webmaster Tools or whatever, it just indexes the page, but only gets the HTML content. It forces you to render the page on your server and just submit it to Google. So why is that? So it adds to the complexity of the developer. So the first complexity is rather than going with the traditional way of developing an application, you create a single page application. So that is good for the consumers. 
but on the other hand it's bad for the developer because in order to get his content indexed he has to do this this ag some that ugly url or whatever then google sends that to you you have to create it render it on your server so why all this pain like why can't well, like there's two ways it is i mean this this must been uh, must be, has been in flash a problem as well like i made the whole website in flash and <laughs> nothing for google I worked on McDonald's code at UK back then that was basically in Flash 3 or something like that. And uh, uh, what I did is I basically I put all the content in XML because that was cool back then and generated the Flash from the XML and generated HTML with XSLT from the XML as well. So I had two different versions of the same website. It rendered the HTML and when you had Flash enabled, it replaced it with the Flash, which was the happiness for everybody else. Now, Google indexing your JavaScript and indexing your applications, that's actually by design that people don't want their applications indexed. Somebody having a ticket website, somebody having a, uh, an Agencia or something or Expedia, they don't want to be indexed by Google with the content that you have in the pages because that's basically content that changes continuously. So the way to work around that would be, first of all, to think about what, uh, what tools the search engine gives you. Things like uh, sitemaps, things like uh, descriptions, things like uh, uh, fallback content. The the danger of it, of course, is that you when you when you just send something only to Google, then they might blacklist you because you're trying to spam them. BMW had that problem. BMW basically had the same website twice in two different languages and redirected for Google just to the other one and they blacklisted them for two weeks or something like that. Didn't hurt them much because they make most of their money by selling cars, not people going to the website. But it's a, it's a very dangerous thing to start playing with, like, if it's Googlebot, then do this. But it, that's the problem. Like, do you want to be indexed on the web or do you want to be an application? I think having a, a good brochureware site around your application, redirecting to the application with a button to the user start working here, would index it in Google and give you the functionality of the application. I'd be scared if my web applications get indexed by Google and they do actually scan uh, uh, JavaScript. If you put URLs in your JavaScript, uh, Google will find them. How they do that, I don't know. Same way they index Flash using, Go using Gordon or their own whatever, whatever version is of Flash renderer in JavaScript. So it's already happening, but um, I think you should concentrate most on actually advertising your application with that. And uh, yeah, let's not get into SEO. That's just such a race that's brutal to do. Uh, one question down there, Rakesh. Yes. I think the next one should ask a question up there. I just love to see him running. So uh, I wanted to ask where uh, forms in HTML, uh, when will, when are they supposed to start supporting methods other than get and post? Uh, like put and... Yes, uh, uh, yes. No idea. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> uh, I would say that with, uh, 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 with the forms itself, why would you need that as a lot of times? Because most of the time a putter would do it with the API and not just get the data from the form. But for example, yeah, with file uploads and things like that, it would be an interesting one. But in a, in a time of, uh, in a time of XHR and JavaScript, I can still do the put requests, uh, with the XHR and don't set, do it with a normal form submit. Then I also have the opportunity of having like a progress bar and reading how far down the line we are because I got the different states of the XHR rather than just the like, I send it off. Good luck to you. So that's one thing to think about. Um, all right, he's been speaking for an hour and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, Christian Heilman. Thank you. I want to take this opportunity again for uh, Mozilla joining us this time for JSFU. Uh, I've been saying this, the Mozilla takeover of JSFU is almost about complete, thanks to people like Robert Nyman, Christian Heilman, uh, Francis Morier, a big round of applause for Mozilla, guys. <laughs> <laughs>